So, thank you for everyone coming. If um, I act strangely, I have a lot of reasons. <laughs> so, dyslexic, raised by German parents, father was captured in Russia, so he transferred all that trauma to me, so I'm still healing from that. Um, Gemini, that explains a lot, and so am I. Um, so, it's great to see so many younger people. We, um, we do a lot of talks, and often it's 100, 200 people in the room. So, the advantage with less people is we can be more, more intimate. Uh, how many born again Christian United Church state people here? Okay, so I can be a little <laughs> less careful with. Let's get to another room, right? You know, sometimes we do like United Church people, and you gotta be more conservative in maybe what you share. Uh, not so much because I'm afraid of like hurting their feelings or them getting offended, but you lose your audience, right? Like right here, we can talk about surfing nude or something, and people would think that's great, right? So, how many people here were here for Clap It Sound? Right? Just a couple of old folks mm -hmm. saying, like, you know, I, I was in elementary school, I heard about it though. Right? So, so my, my background actually is as an environmental activist. I really see myself as an activist that hides behind food because after all the years of activism, I found the single most effective way to reach people is through food because we all eat through this very primal, primordial, survival, angry. I haven't had a latte for 20 minutes, I'm getting Jones in, right? so reaching people. So I'd like to ask a little bit about the people in the room, because I would like to think that collectively we have a lot of intelligence in the room. So even if, if I know more than most people in the room, collectively, all the people in this room, theoretically, probably have more life experience and have more to offer than I do as an individual. So the more we can draw from you folks, the more I can get a sense of you before I even begin, then the, the more we can kind of read from what you bring to the room. So how many of you folks are vegans? Good, so I want to be careful about talking about shooting and killing animals, okay? Just conscious, right? Respectful. Um, how many of you are already growing food? And how many of you have been growing food for a long time? Wow. Okay, so that's a really great mix. Now, some other technical questions. You, you know, I'll reveal what I'm up to, you know, eventually. Because um, it gives me a sense of, of, you know, where you folks are coming from. And it'll also dovetail nicely some of the things that will come up in the talk because who we are as people, how we were raised, what culture we come from, if we're from British Columbia, <laughs> and we eat cucumber sandwiches with cream cheese with the crust cut off, you know, er everything influences how we are in the world in the lens we look through, right? Like, I'm a, I'm a white male, and even though I think I've had a really hard life, and I have, I don't realize that there are other people in the world, you know, like women, gay people, brown people, gay women who are brown, right? They, they've had a completely different experience than I have, right? And so, so that's, you know, that's a bit more extreme, Right? But something that's a little less talked about. How many people here are first children? First, 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 first children. Uh, I'm birth order. First you were born first. Oh. first yeah, see? Like first first children. Uh, middle children? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Playful last children? Wow, that is a really good mix. Okay, only children. Oh. Oh. So just for fun, just so you don't feel completely like, what the hell is he talking about? Uh, the vast majority of CEOs are first children. Big surprise. Mm, what? The vast majority of CEOs are first children. Oh, I'll take charge. You know, just senior children. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the vast majority of mediators are middle children. Can we just please get along? Right? The vast majority of 78% of talk show hosts are only children. It's all about me. So even when I interview someone, even when I interview someone, the focus is on me. I tell them to play the music I see when we go to commercial, right? Yeah. And did I miss one? One show? This, first? Youngest. 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 Oh, yeah. Youngest. In the best word here, comedians are last role. <laughs> Billy Crystal, Eddie Murphy, right? Sally. Wow. Right? Yeah. So, because they're most likely to be more playful, especially if they're a miracle child, you know, born later, and they get to be in the stroller till like six years old, and you know, yeah, lots of balloons, lots of lollipops, right? So, yeah. so, so all of that is gonna affect how you are even in this meeting. So if you're a last child, and especially if you're a stereotypical textbook last child who's playful, then a talk like this, you're gonna be much better served if there's a bit of fun, right? And if you're a first child, you're gonna be looking for a lot more facts and structure. Just give me the information, stop goofing around. Right? <laughs> and if you're a real child, you just like us all day long today and not get into the So it's just, it's just good to be aware that that is going to affect how you grow food and what types of methods you're going to use. And the reason that's important is because 
I mean, there's this thing we've heard ever since I was a little kid, is everyone's different. We say this, we say this, we say this, but then, you know, I know we have a teacher in the room, for example, right? And someday I'm gonna, I hope to give talks at SEC and C8 and 69, because we always say this, everyone says, oh, there's all kinds of people, all, all, all kinds of animals in the art, we have this term we use, but in actuality, we, then we have children, you know, children. Just, and they're like, why don't you quiet down? Why don't you, oh, you're too shy, you're too this, you're too that. So, so we have this intellectual concept that we're all different, but when it comes to the application, like let's say you and I start going food, right? It's like, oh, we're not gonna do it like that, are we? That's not how my mom did it, that's not how my dad did it. That's not, we don't do Germany, <laughs> right? Just, right, so, so we have this concept that we're so diverse, you know, British Columbia, and we're just so open to new ideas. I mean, but when it comes right down to it, like when we're in a relationship and how we're gonna cook eggs, like the rest we had on cooking the eggs, right? Like, I can't believe that. Like, I will just pass out. I don't want to go. I want that yolk to explode in my mouth. Oh, no, I hate that. Right? So, so everything is affected by our personality. Okay. Permaculture. <laughs> Let me come back. Uh, so, why, why are you folks here? Just a few. Why are you here? Because I heard this was going to be the best talk of the week. Oh, yeah. the pressure. Oh. Okay. What else can you hear? The sex. Sex? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty test rate. The sex. No, it's supposed to be the sex. Right? Okay, uh, at least one more. What are you going to bring you? Two more. Um, Biointensively, I was hoping to get more out of my garden. Excellent. Excellent. And you had your hand up. Come on, don't be chicken. I want, I want to be warm. <laughs> it's too cold outside. <laughs> so are you saying you want to be with someone and have sex that keeps you warm? No, I just want to be warm. <laughs> so you want to it's grow more firewood too? Well, I think it's, it's I mean, whatever you're going to talk about is interesting. Okay, well, you take a sleeping bag and stuff from straw in. I'm just wanting to read it back to permaculture because I have to respect everybody else. Okay. All right. Okay, so permaculture. What do people think permaculture is? And are you going to time keep? Who's got a time? Who's going to have the same one? I'm going to watch here. Okay, so can you tell me when we're at the 30 minute mark, please? Uh, sure. And then the 45 minute mark? Yes. And then, we'll make sure then the 55 minute mark. And then, so let me just back up housekeeping. Yes, it's been a busy couple of days. Um, so we generally go an hour and a half. We've only been allotted an hour, but Leah put us at the end. So if you folks want to go an hour and a half or however long for question period, because it's really hard for us to do a talk like this and take questions an hour. So the talk tends to be an hour, and then even with the old, you know, gardening clubs have sleep people, it's an hour and a half, right? So you folks can already mention an hour and a half, even though it's the end of Sunday. So at the one hour mark, let's just check in with you folks, see how you're feeling. We can slip in some questions as we're going, but we tend to do a talk for an hour and then go to questions. So if you need time, we'd really appreciate it because I have no sense of time. Can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> Spock has sense of time. I don't. So thank you for being a Spock in my life. That's a couple. Just Okay, so what do people think permaculture is? Let's see what people think, please. Well, they're making culture permanent, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that resonates, eh? Permanent culture, responsibility, ability to respond. Permanent culture. What else? What does, per what does permaculture look to you in your minds? I mean, I have an idea what I think permaculture is, but maybe you folks have some very different ideas that, that I haven't thought of, and then we can add them. It looks kind of like like what you would imagine as sort of an Eden, at least from the pictures I've seen. It looks very, very f like full of, of, of full of ba like full of bounty, very, very full. Like there's a lot, like there's the, the three layers that are very visible. You have like a lot in the trees, a lot down there, and a lot below. It looks very beautiful, almost. You know, and I think that's an excellent point because we've been to organic farms. Oh, it's going to change. <laughs> we've been to organic farms. It's getting too hot. That's why I know. You know, like people in our circle, where they have the perfect rows of lettuce and cabbage and all of that, yeah. and they've got all of this soil showing, and the land is getting dry, and then they're wondering why the ponds are drying up, the cisterns are empty, and everything else. Because when they came for that one year training, where I tried to show them, they weren't really, right? They watched too much YouTube, right? <laughs> so, so permaculture, absolutely, to me is um, at least how I approach permaculture. And I don't usually make much reference to permaculture because it's it's become a thing, right? Like, I was joking, Nicole, you know, like, you're the only woman in Tofino who's not wearing blindstones, like, so you're like, are you really uncool, or are you so cool that you don't have to wear them, right? So, so we always have to be careful that something doesn't become a religion, like our friends who are polyamorous, our friends who go to Peru and do the ayahuasca thing, and it's always like, I just feel sorry, so sorry for you, only having sex with, like, one person, right? So, so, so things become a thing, right? Oh, sensual, sensual, you're smiling too much, you need some essential oil, so you're frowning too much, you're some sensual, so we make things, so I'm careful to make, 
permaculture not a, like another thing, another religion, that if you don't join my church, then you suck. I'm just so much more spiritual. I'm so much more Tofino, because my surfboard was made with twigs, right? So, so permaculture to me, uh, after you know farming for many years and then suddenly taking the course and finding out that we're doing most of that stuff, is something that we do naturally as humans that is actually taught out of us that we need to relearn and are learning, and anyone who lives in Tofino is learning it without even trying to because you're forced to learn it, and that is just being aware of what's around us. And I think that's one of the reasons we noticed yesterday, ooh, smiling. I've just never seen so many people not smile. I mean, there's a few people who are on Bernie that didn't smile. No offense to Bernie that are in the room, but, but they're, you know, because you're in this environment that is constantly giving you this amazing input. Right? And the weather, and oh my goodness, and oh, see that? Oh, clear sky, oh, it's going to be foggy quick, get on the board, right? There's this constant, oh, it's going to get wet, it's going to get cold, it's going to be sunny, oh, it's going to blow, oh, the dong, you know, you wake up, dong, 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 the, the, the right? The freaking, uh, the, 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 dong, 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 that, sh you know, jaws, right? Right? And then, and then, uh, nah, like, okay, no visibility. I'll see if I can get some work today doing some serving, make some tips, buy a new board. Right? So there's this constant awareness. And so that's how permaculture is for me. It's this awareness of what is happening all around me. And that's why the sex piece is so important. And let's just inject it before we do the slide. So, movies. I have seen, and most of us have seen at least 100 movies where there's a guy and girl, man and woman, being chased through the whole movie by the bad guys, the good guys, the cops, the army. Everyone's trying to kill them. Right? They're not eating, not sleeping. But they still find a motel room to have sex. Right? 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 You are under, like, adrenals, right? Just like, oh, oh, right? Right? Okay. Coyotes. Right? 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 When the white man came to North America, you want you? Get one? The white man came to North America, there was X number of coyotes. So, 200 years. Bad juju. Bad juju. Okay? It's like omen. Um, 200 years of trapping them, shooting them, poisoning them, uh, using wire, long wire with shark hooks and hooking the babies out of the dens. You know, dynamite, flooding. We now have more coyotes in North America than we ever had, ever before in the history of civilization. And they're starting to breed with the wolves. We've got a whole different I mean, a little hybrid, super duper, wily coyote, part wolf, pipe. Kind of, right? So why did that happen? Because that's how nature responds, distress. right? And that's right? distress. Yes, I'm gonna say sex, stress, same, same, first letter, yes. layer, connected, right? <laughs> and so basically, what happens to the coyotes is that all the coyotes work together communally to raise the babies, right? uncles and aunts. And so who were the two point people? Like the Vietnam War, it was the point person. The first person who would get shot was called the point person. So the, the alpha male and alpha female are the point type. So they're the first to go up the hill to look for something to eat. And they were the first to get the 30-30 repeater rifle. Well, the moment they're killed, guess what? All the aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters start making babies. Right? So, so the moment you understand the, the power of sex in nature, Terminator? Anyone not seen Terminator? Okay. Right? Cyborg. Cyborg. Liquid metal. Robots chasing you. They still found a hotel. Half dead, shot, wounded. Still found time to make love and make babies. And so when you understand that, when we're growing food, we can harness that power of nature and observe that. And so a quick example, when beans are attacked by insects, they will yield up to 30% more beans. So part of permaculture, and part of biointensive is understanding these kind of stressors and we can actually kind of work together with nature, observe nature, and rather than just right away look at something that's good and bad and right or wrong and say, okay, how can I work with this environment? So when the potato beetles were completely destroying the potato plant, we ripped it out, all the potato beetles, which are tiny, minuscule little things, jumped to the next potato plant. Right? Well, this potato plant has already set out its defenses and it was already under attack. It already sent chemical messages through the mycelium, mycelium to the other potato plants, which were already developing more oxalic acid, so the potato plants <coughs> didn't want to go to these, right? And so we just leave that one there, and we let <coughs> things happen, and then what happens? Insects come along and say, wow, this whole cornucopia, smorgasbord of flea beetles, and they got them all right there, and then now those predators, they have babies, 
then they go hide in the rocks or whatever, and the next year we have predator being prowlers. While you run around and you say, well, I'm going to kill all lions, or I'll destroy all the zebras, well, you're never going to kill all the zebras, right? And in the process of your diatomaceous earth killing the zebras, which are bad guys, right? You end up killing the good guys, the lions, right? And you only have five lions, but you have 500 zebras. So you killed 400 zebras, so you've got 100 zebras left, and you killed the lions. So next year, like, we have even more zebras than last year. That diatomaceous earth the shit, right? So, so just more things, okay. Hey, girls. Right. Okay, so our last place uh, after we left after 16 years and a three and a half legal battle of urban farming. If you want to know about that, it's, it was a sort of tale to spend over hundred thousand dollars driving us crazy, and you just do dirt back or landfill. Yeah. Okay, so we moved here to Hell's Ranger Biker gravel. As you can see, there's barely a weed. And when people visit, I say, here's a hundred dollars if you can find one insect, one ant, one snake, one anything. You can keep that hundred dollars. No one ever found anything. So Hell's Angel Biker, and in four years, that. Four years? Yeah. Wow. And so when people come to the house, whether it's 20 minutes to buy a rain barrel or one, an hour and a half, the first thing I say, in case they suddenly go, oh, I gotta go to bring my kids to ballet, swimming, hockey, baseball, gotta go to Starbucks, right? I say, there's only one thing that you learn here today is grow soil, right? You want a bit mental health? Grow better soil, so to speak, in your environment. Mm -hmm. Want to be less angry, less hyper, less yeast infections, less stinky, less, right? So the equivalent of growing healthy soil is the shit in your, right? So yeah. colon is one pound, four pounds of bacteria, so five pounds. John Wayne, autopsy, 25 pounds. He was literally full of shit. No judgment there, just fact, just <laughs> observation. Right? So, our biome. So, our biome then matches up with your biome, which is why, you know, we need to eat locally and in season, because when you're eating a whole bunch of citrus fruits and all kinds of fancy fruit from around the world, you grow in completely different soil, which has completely completed biome, which is neurobiochemicals, everything is different. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, people who eat the food in their area are healthy, because that is, you know, the, the, their genetic makeup is literally in accordance with the minerals that are already in that soil, which is why when you go to a funeral or memorial and you dirt bury the person and you do that hole and you take some dirt or soil, and now they have nice clean sand, and you put soil on the casket and you say what? From ashes to ashes, from dust to dust, right? However biblical, fact of the matter is we all come from the soil, okay? And that's what the land's like. So this is our next place. So not only was there no, that grass wasn't there, so not only was there no soil, the horses that they, the 12 horses they had completely nuked the place and with rocks sticking up, uh, and it was dust, they also put down pea gravel. So we spent the first year just raking up pea gravel every time it froze. So to that, and thank you for, perfect, not trouble, <laughs> that, four years. So that, uh, some, how many of you have heard of Hugel Kocher? Okay, okay. So Hugel, Austrian, German, Hill culture, culture. So Hill culture. Sepp Holzer, Austria. People from all around the world going to see this guy and so just, he's like the guru of Hugo culture. And people around here more and more are using Hugo culture, which is simply piling a whole bunch of stuff. We put logs and sticks and branches and all kinds of any other crap we have dead animals, anything you can find, <laughs> delicially. And then whatever else we could find, whatever soil we could find, manure. And they'll grow all of the food on a hill culture. Uh, we're growing commercially. This is what we do for a living, so we have to be a little bit more judicious. So we will allow, there's some purple orc in there. Um, and we, will, we also do things you're not supposed to do. Apparently the book, whatever, that book that I haven't read, that I'm supposed to read, <laughs> that I would find out that I'm doing many things wrong, um, that I won't read, because one of the advantages of just trying to do things is you'll learn things, just like in a relationship. Like if all of you had read a book on how to be a relationship, you would have <laughs> learned all the things that you did wrong in the relationships you've been in. And so what I have found is Trial, learning by doing things is much more powerful because you'll end up doing things you shouldn't have done. And you'll end up discovering things like the light bulb and the wheel and all kinds of other things accidentally. Like a lot of things, that's how inventions, people just, right, invent things, mess around, and then suddenly they go, you can use this type of things, right? And so one of the things the book says is not to grow potatoes, but that's potatoes on either side. And so we get, you know, uh, several, you know, a couple thousand pounds of potatoes, and then that will be um, about. 3,000 pounds of butternut squash, and then from 
there this way is three kinds of mellow. And I should say, you know, what I'm more up to here is inspiration. There's anything that you see here, you will be able to do, including Interpino. We make a point of not doing anything fancy, like we don't have lemon trees, we don't do anything weird, anything fancy, anything special, we don't buy any fertilizers, we don't anything, because we want whatever we do to be transferable. It doesn't feel good to me to say, well, you know, we use bone meal, blood meal, blah, 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 green sand, grown from ground rocks all the way from the interior, you know, brought here, ground up by a huge diesel monster, and then brought here by a truck, and then I go and pick it up, and like, totally sustainable. <laughs> whatever. And so, so we like to do things in a way that, that, you know, we know that you will be able to repeat, right? Replicatable, transferable, okay? And so, so the slides and most of what we tend to talk about, we focus more on inspiration than information. We have lots of information that we can share, and we'll, we'll share some of that by you asking questions, so we'll give you the information you need and want, rather than me giving you information that I think you should have. Does that make sense? So our focus more is showing you what can be done by two people, old, tired people. I'm going to be 60 in, in June, right? And, and then so, so if you are anywhere near as capable, and anywhere near as healthy, right, then you can do exactly what you see here, which is 16,000 pounds of food on, on one acre of now 15 acres. Okay, um, so you can see the, in there, potatoes are plowing, drip irrigation to answer that question, deer fence, uh, very permaculture style, the, the fence comes down each year, and then we let the chickens go in there and they eat all the bad bugs, they eat some of the worms too, right, so, so that fence will come down and fall after we've harvested it and the deer come in there and other creatures and so we get the benefit of all of that and this chicken scratch and the worms as it gets cold and wet the worms the bad worms the wire worms come to the top and the chickens can see they get those and then that's going right up to here okay right good job okay people a moment here pretty faster they read it rather than me filling the space done tell me when I see them still working. Oh, yes, we experienced the last one, definitely. Yeah. And we're down to 2% now. Yeah. Camel River's at 1%. You know, we don't even really want to think about what you that, right? So we're talking about a national crisis, right? Mm. You see, I say it in a nice face. Yeah. We're talking about a national crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, because people are way more risk ready to listen if people are positive and encouraging. So even though sometimes I feel very angry, bitter, toxic, negative, depressed, right, I have learned that, you know, people want to hear that shit. So you want to reach people, you know, you got to... Well, boys and girls, you got to do the Mr. Rogers thing, right? Because you don't want to trigger that primordial, like, you know, right? A guilt trip or whatever, you know, goes off in people's defensive bias confirmation, confirming, you know, primordial animal protection, caveman, there's no climate change reaction. You want to, yeah, that's an idea. Yeah, we need to grow more food. You know, yeah. Okay. Um, Lanso, not that long ago. Potatoes, Lanso. Women sitting around drinking all day. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, women work. Those days, they did nothing. Yeah. Okay. So here's what we grow on less than an acre. I mean, I mean, was, was, that, was that enough time? Maybe it is. Couldn't go back a second. Mm -hmm. Watch people's eyes. Mm -hmm. Just, <laughs> just watch them. Okay, how's that? Okay, give me a head nod. Okay, next. Okay, where are we going? Are we talking about working with nature? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so snakes, pile of rocks. Going to be a little bit more challenging to Pino, a little bit colder. And just sure, I should say, um, Ninus has cacti in the hills. And we were growing in gravel, and we were planting potatoes February 1st. So we moved to Arrington, 20 minutes away. We lost six weeks of growing. Mm -hmm. Six weeks. So six weeks of income. So basically, you know, you go to work for six weeks, but you don't get a paycheck, right? Colder, wetter, distance from the ocean, elevation. Mm -hmm. So it was like completely opposite from sand and gravel to swamp, like swamp grass, beaver, otter, mink, um, wet, cold. Foggy, and then we really lost yet more when the forest fires, and then we we're fogged in, like Tiffany know from the forest fires and the smoke and everything else, and our watermelon didn't ripen. So we have both ends of spectrum. So we have we, we now farm in a way that's in an area that's much more co has much more in common with Tofino than in Nanaimo and uh, Lanceville and Right? 
So we, we feel your pain. Okay. Um, you know, so one of the first things we talk when someone comes to the house is if, if there's, a, even if you're really poor, fruit trees. Like the moment you can go out and get some fruit trees, and worst case, you know, if you think you're just renting or whatever, you can maybe pop them for a little while, and it would be better to dig them, put them in the ground and then dig them back up in a couple of years. Fruit trees, because, you know, they take time, right? And so for the first two years, we pick all the fruit off when they're just little babies, because you want all the energy going into, right? But we get desperate, we get excited, oh, I want my first steak, well, so all that energy is going to what? That tree making babies, right? It's a coyote again, it's a coyote tree. Right? It's threatened, it's attacked, so we've got to make babies. So now that energy is going into making little apples. And I've seen people in the animal where they've got this little thin apple tree and it's all braced up and everything else and breaking because they, they keep trying to make, it, make one or two or three apples. And they should be making no apples, just roots. Right? You know, all the energy going into making baby baby apples, baby apple trees, right? So swallows, they are just, and any birds that you can cultivate are a gift in terms of dealing with insect control. And the other thing with swallows is, um, uh, uh, and when I say permaculture and paying attention, I'm also speaking intuitively. So if I don't come across as new agey, it's probably because I'm not, but that isn't to say that I don't tap into new agey psycho spiritual realities. You know, energy on the earth, the magnetic fields, the stuff that the birds and all the other animals tap into, the whales and sonar and all of that stuff, right? And so an example is one time we're looking out the window and the swallow showed up and I just burst into tears. I said, the swallows are here. It's time to plant zucchini. And then I felt there, so. Oh, I just got something in my eye. <laughs> you know, right? And then so then a few weeks later, these incredible studies come out in other parts of the world where the monks have been planting according to the swallows showing up at their whatever abbey in Italy or Germany or France for thousands of years. That they were using the swallows, which magnetic fields, stars, temperature, gravity, tides, winds. Well, like sex. Planting. Not planting, sorry. Coral. All has, you'll have sex one night of the year. When all of the stars, the moon, everything, shh, 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 whoosh, boom, like that. It's one giant, ginormous, global orgy. Okay? So they're tuned in. So permaculture to me is actually just tuning into like all of the information that already exists all around us, always has, and is in us. We just need to reconnect with, you know, the divine, the creator, the, the life force that you know, just get goosebumps, that, that God is here in the first place, the, the miracle of life. I mean, the fact that all of us are here in the room, that we made it, that human beings, these crazy people, have made it to 7.3 billion. How do we do that? So, two things. One, sex. It feels good, right? So that's what people do. If it didn't feel good, no, I'm not doing that. Right? And agriculture. Being able to produce more food than you need. Please. What? 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. Mason and bees. There's still three minutes to thirty minutes. It's yeah. <laughs> See, even though that, that's a crazy thing for me, I just if we need people like that. <laughs> you can go to Germany to take up the tens of my time. They can see. They just go like this. They have a stopwatch. They go. <laughs> just like that. Yeah. 230k. You can watch it. They have a little screen on this train, and you can see their trains are going 230k. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what are they? They pollinate what? 100 times more than 300 uh, times more. Sir. 300 times more. 300 times more. So you can imagine how much work these little guys do, right? They may not make you honey, right? They may not impress your neighbors. Oh, no. So that's a bee hotel. Yeah, it is. Yes. Okay. And so, you know, it's one of the first things people do when they come to our place, like, you know, do you do this, do you do that, do you do like this, do you, they're not doing anything, they're living in a like, subdivision, right? but you do. And one of the first things, do you have bees? And we go, oh yeah, we have bees. We have bees. <laughs> and they're pollinating our trees and the neighbor's trees, because they'll also fly a lot further. Okay. Uh, our seed potatoes, so we save, you know, let's say 600 pounds of tomatoes every year. Uh, fish totes, pretty easy to get into, you know, great for weight storage, store food, keep bears out, right? Fish totes. Then you sleep. Uh, here's Nicole planting. Um, potatoes in the snow when it, we've actually planted them in the snow when it's actually snowing and we plant them early we plant them deep because we don't like to spend time and energy watering and so, so then we just keep filling in the trench and that the potatoes just like they growing the potatoes in the boxes and the barrels and everything else we're just applying the same principle here so then we've got three sets of potatoes and then we by the time we harvest them and August, September, they are in dust, and we actually harvest them with their bare hands or gloves. We, we dig a hole, and then we just kind of collapse it into the hole, right? Okay. Cold frame, so, you know, uh, what a tendency we all have is, okay, I'm not going to do X until I have money to do X. Just 
get an old sliding glass door and a shower door, some scraps of wood, and this coal train has saved our life so many times where, where we um, planted all of the squash and then they just had the two little um, not non-true leaves, just the little initial little tiny leaves, and the, squ the quail go along and they're like, oh, it's like, <laughs> that little thing that's your brain, right? <laughs> and they just, they just wrecked every one. So, so now we, we've lost X amount of days, right? And we got to start again. So, boom, we pounded like 300, three sets of 30 plants through that coal vein in the yard. Soil, quick metaphor. Construction, excavator. Subdivision, big pile of soil. You know they pile of soil, and then they, they scrape it off, and they sell it back to you. Scrape it off, sell it. It's just it's a great deal for that. Thirty minutes. Developers. Thank you. <laughs> so this one guy just told me the other day when we did a talk, pile, twenty six feet high. Thistles. The roots were twenty six feet long, and kept going. <laughs> right. So this is why friends, weeds can be your friends. Right. So we tend to let some of our weeds at least grow until they've gone further because none of the vegetables you're ever going to grow other than maybe alfalfa are going to have that kind of root depth. So they're going down because we get three to four feet or here we get like eight feet of rain or a portal running eight feet of rain. So all those nutrients, especially going on buying stuff, are all being washed away. So weeds and worms are two of your best friends in terms of going down, capturing those nutrients, and then when you compost those weeds or feed them to the chickens, to the ducks, or the goats, you're now recapturing these nutrients that are being washed away by gravity combined with rain. Okay. Ducks, um, ducks are a much more ethical creature because they tolerate uh, cold better and all chickens, even if they're fluffy, what are those things called? Arctic one? Norwegian something, those super duper chickens that are great in the Arctic. Oh, I know those Icelandic? Yeah, the Icelandic chickens. Iceland. I find chickens. Still, all chickens are from Java, so, so you know, the, even these ducks that are from the tropics, Muscovies, are still more appropriate to our climate because of moisture. And so the chickens, they get sick all the time. They get 12 different calls. And, ah, eh, oh, eh, ah, eh. and then there's a... Like, the ducks, like, never get sick, and they never die. It's completely natural to have X amount of chickens just die of, what do they call it, unknown causes or natural causes, right? They're just <laughs> part of the chicken world. Well, the ducks, they just seem to be like in structure. They're just water for ducks back. And they lay rather than like these commercial chickens that people buy, the little round things, that the hybrid GMO, super duper Monsanto chickens. You know, you get good eggs for a year, then after that, almost nothing. These are just made to pound them up for a year, and then you just compost them. You know, organic farmers are just composting them, right? Just dropping your eggs, composting them. Is uh, the, the um, ducks, four years. Okay, yeah. And there's another view, and I, one of the reasons we have the slide is people in our circles always talk about, you know, someday I'm going to get solar panels. Well, so right now we can benefit from solar energy. Okay. See? Laundry. So I always find it funny when we go to our green friends' houses, they're like super green and, you know, recycling and everything else, but, and it's summertime, and the dryer is going. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, so to me that's also included in permaculture, like, okay, I want to spend less time going to work, I want to, I want to have more money to buy a tractor or buy bun stones, right? Well, <laughs> then, you know, buy a clothesline, and in one summer you'll have money for bun stones, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, in biointensive, Chinese have been practicing it for 5,000 years. The French have been practicing it for 250 years. The short version, everything is tighter and closer. So you're really capitalizing on the maximum use of the land and the soil. So you're minimizing. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Okay, you can find us on the internet. Transformation. Thank you. Um, maximizing. So our pathway is only 12 inches wide. Right? So you're really maximizing the use of your land and you're walking less. So if we were roller sailing, we'd be using two acres to produce the same amount of food. Um, and if we were doing tractor farming, then we would be using five acres. So still some amount of food and actually our labor would go up. Our, some of our labor would go down because we'd be using a tiller and a tractor, but then there'd be, we'd have to go further. And then we have you know, the tractor and, da -da 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 -da. and you saw irrigation and walking with the vegetables because the tractors are doing everything. It's just doing some of the mechanical work. You're not going to pick carrots with the tractor and carry them with the tractor. You're going to do that by hand. So it actually, so it actually ends up being less work 
to <coughs> grow biointensively and have what we call no man's land or no woman's land, just to be egalitarian. And so some of these plants will be left to go to seed, and then you end up this where there's no soil exposed because your number one enemy is erosion. Like the problem with clear cutting, when like a lot of like the tourists are whole clear cutting, oh, it's it's ugly or the washouts. But if you actually look at the washouts from clear cutting, they're minimal. There's just these little strips where the all the soils come. So the real issue with clear cutting, at least from my perspective, biological perspective, is the sun killing the mycelium. Mm -hmm. There are places in BC they planted five times and still not taken. Mm -hmm. Even if they plant, correct the, the right species versus planting ten times as you know, that's really smart. Right? And so, so the more you can protect the soil, thank you, sweetie. You see the lettuce in there? And the kale? Right? So, again, what's the number one rule? Soil. And what's the number one growing ingredient? Oxygen. So not water, not sunlight, not soil. Oxygen. So always be thinking about not compacting. When we weed, we, even, we don't even put our hands on the land. Where are we for time there? Where are we here? <laughs> oh, uh, we're only we're only five minutes over the thirty minutes. Okay, wow. Minutes. Seeing that compressed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so so we don't even put our hands on the land when we weed because the number one growing ingredient is oxygen. So St. John Damon is twelve years old. I was so surprised when they said when they said get the car accident, the person squirting under the neck because right away I think okay you know stop the weeding. No, no, breathing. If they're not reading, <laughs> it doesn't matter if they're squirting, right? Right? Like when, when a person dies within a few minutes, right, their whole body chemistry changes and flies show up and up the nose and all other orifices, right? It's everything's changed. And it's that, that oxidation or the rusting that the, everything's changed through that lack of oxygen. So no one growing ingredient to grow food is oxygen. So that's what keeping the soil loose and aerated and Technically speaking, what tilling is about, but the problem with tilling is you do all this oxidation because you're disturbing the strata, right? Strata of the ocean, the strata of the lake, your strata of the atmosphere. You're 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 damaging this complex of all these different microbes that are living at these different levels, right? So that's why it's so great to pull weeds because you're doing some disturbance. A broad fork, you're doing a disturbance. Uh, a fork like this, you're doing some disturbance, but you're not creating this upheaval. You're not doing uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. You know, uh, you know, genocide of the all these creatures that we can't see that we didn't know existed until we invented this in our microscope. And before that, of course, they didn't exist, right? Because things don't exist if we see them. Right? <laughs> That's right. And for percent mm -hmm. Okay. Again, biodiversity, letting the grasses grow, bringing the bees in. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and personality. You know, do th do things that work for you. Like when I got into this game because of my upbringing and my cultural orientation and you know lack of control and the need for control, I did things like took pieces of wood and drilled holes in them and dropped the seats through the holes and I took pieces of one by four and put nails in it in perfect spacing with a measuring tape, you know, carpenter, and made perfect holes and put the beats in perfect lines. And it was just so much energy and it wasn't in alignment with these other values I was beginning to learn, which was working with nature. And I made so many mistakes that just blew my mind how much I didn't know until I knew that I didn't know it, right? Because you don't know what you don't know until you know and then you realize and then you wonder what you do still don't know and so that was kind of terrifying for me when I when, um, when I spent months uh, sifting you know I made these screens I made three different gen generation of screens you know because they saw everyone do it my mom did it neighbors did it I sifted the entire garden just like some kind of cycle two feet down <laughs> sifted just like some kind of weird you know run forest run like some kind of mental case right and I just I just and it turned to a desert, you know, and then those nice plots of the black earth with all the worms, so I just kept throwing those up, and throwing them, look at that, I got, oh, look at that, perfect for germination. Well, so it took years to undo that, because I just destroyed the soil. I mean, would you do that? Would you go in the forest and sift it all, put it back, and say, oh, it would be really good for growing cedar and Douglas fir. Look at that salal, so happy in that desert. Right? It's all that biodiversity and all that life. It takes a thousand years for one inch of soil. That's why clear cutting is so bad. A thousand years. And so we're trying to do what nature does in a thousand years. So how crazy is it to go up to your garden and 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 filter it to get the little rocks out and make it all nice and neat and tidy? Oh yeah, look at that. But in the meantime, it's just like taking the ocean, right? Just like we'll just take a big vacuum container like the fish farms and we'll just suction the ocean out and just filter it through some kind of filter and get all that yucky plankton up there. <laughs> and the little crap and the little chronomids and the little shrimp and all. We don't need all that crap in there. We need nice clean filtered water for the orcas, you know, because they don't poon it. <laughs> so it's biodiversity. And so the reason you see things straight in our slides is because we do it for a living. We can't be doing fancy keyhole gardening. We can't do all kinds of new agey. Oh, it's those things where people walk 
Spiral. Spiral. Labyrinth. Yeah, we, Spiral. Labyrinth. We can't. We just can't because we're getting up at o'clock in the morning. We're picking. We're running. Like literally running. We don't want to get up any earlier, so we just get up a little bit later. Nicole's having her coffee. We don't talk. Rubber bands. <laughs> <laughs> to the farmer's market. And so, so straight lines, the van backed up, getting stuff in. So we have to think in terms of efficiency. Okay. <laughs> and the strings actually more for visitors because you wouldn't believe how many people, no offense to people who have video cameras, hey, how's it going? Ah, and it's just like, I'm just trying to get stop, 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 stop. And then they're like, what, what, what? And then, okay, just, okay, one foot there, one foot there. It's just, right, the lack of awareness, right? They're not permaculturalist people who visit. They just think that, you know, like, just, I'm just going to go there, you know, street. <laughs> So we have the string, so I'm like, oh, it's going to work between the string? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a, you know, an example of what things look like. We've moved more to drip now, but when we moved in, we had no money. We were so poor. That's a little bit of a poor. We were so poor. We got some soil from a local company, thank you. And we would just take a, a piece of potato and lay it on the ground, on the turf, right, and on the clay. And we would just put a shovel full of soil on top of the potato, and then the wind would blow that away, and then it wouldn't grow because the potato would start getting chlorophyll and think, oh, I'm a plant, like in the greens. So that's how tough our first year was. And I wasn't starting over at like 20 or 30 or 40, I was starting out over at 55, so like brand new, starting over, and coming in with a lot of like mental, emotional exhaustion, you know, damage, bitterness, right? So it was quite something, oh, maybe back and you just, uh, you just might go away. Okay, um, uh, so we do peace here, and then uh, when the peace start, uh, fading than the beans. So this whole fence here, X amount of beans and um, and peas in one chunk, and then the the beans kind of shade the peas a little bit. So we extend the peas. Garlic, potatoes. Here's another extra pea fence. So relay, right? More peas. What are we, what's oh, all this? The fruit trees, um, fruit trees, raspberries, and then the usual stuff. And, and you, one of the first questions people ask: You have a greenhouse? We've never had one. This has a little tiny, 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 tiny one. We just basically use for spreading plants, right? And we like to be like that because then people can see that it is possible to do this without mm. a greenhouse. And technically, a greenhouse is something that's heated, so it would be a hoop house. But anyway, so we have that little thing there where we store stuff and we um, we fill with rain barrels, fill the rain barrels with water. The rain the rain barrels capture and hold heat, and then we build the tables on top of that because I don't really like doing everything on my hands and knees, right? And so the rain barrels make a fantastic table with plywood with some core class signs from the last time. Frost Fraser, you know, NDP signs, all put in there and everything else, and we can pour water on him, I mean on the signs, and, and it's like also a flooding table, so we can just go in there and flood all the plants by just pouring a whole bucket of uh, fish, not fish fertilizer, compost tea. Yes, you're supposed to know exactly what I'm thinking, every time I ask you a question. It's been 11 years of this. <laughs> we did some wine after this, we'll be okay. Look, just get a straw. But uh, uh, glass or stainless steel straw, no plastic straws. Because <laughs> otherwise they'll come right out of the turtle's nose. You know, that's, that's been the whole straw thing now, you know, the straw, you know, more straws. It's from that turtle video. Is anyone not seeing the turtle video with the straw? I haven't. Okay, so, so ask your friend, you know, you have it? Oh my god, you're just not on the internet. You're not on Facebook enough. You know, you're missing out. Anyway, basic short version, uh, sea turtle, straw in the nose, and then, like maybe German tourist piece, something like that, German accent that looked like she was using like a leatherman on the boat, you know, like a little, mm -hmm. you know, inspector gadget pliers, and the turtle's going, wee, wee, and then you're pulling the straw, and so suddenly that became like this vile reader was like, you know, we should stop using plastic toss. Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so on one hand, it's just ridiculous, like a turtle has to have a straw, and of course the turtle would have eaten that straw and then snarkled it out this way and it would have been stuffed, right? So, so that's what has to happen before we start, right? So the flip side of that is, there, yeah, there's some real learning. You want to get people to stop using straws, stop telling them about plastic bags, show them a picture of the six pack ring around the bird, right? Right? So, visual, nature, empathy, suffering, <laughs> right? Hey? Yeah. Okay. What do you follow here? We'll go through quickly these, okay? Uh, gutters, lettuce, palette, bird's eye view. Yeah, use whatever you have because uh, you come in, oh, I don't have a mistake, I don't have da, 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 da. Use what you have, right? Dance with the one who brought you. Think? <laughs> <laughs> right? Don't don't be lonely. Don't be sad. Don't be depressed. Just find someone that will go in the dance floor with you. Right? Hey? Okay. Oh, so you look at that. Oh, yeah. See? Yeah. 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 It works, right? Oh. Where are you last shot? 
Who, who was that? Was that you laughing? Was that, <laughs> no, I didn't do you that. Just like that? Okay. You who was that? Oh. Someone back there. <laughs> who was the odd person? You were the odd person. Yeah. See, so, so, so we could talk all day about how you could go, you know, and you sh you, you should do it like this. But you saw a picture of dogs and uh, you know flowers in the house. You're like, right? Connects, right? Okay. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Lot of people. So, how do we get to 3.7.3 3 billion people? Sex. Besides sex videos. <laughs> and this, you know, incredible drive, millions of square miles out of a second in 1987, but it didn't help. Um, <laughs> you know, and this incredible drive to, you know, incendiate the earth, <laughs> spread my seed, <laughs> sow my oats. Um, caring for each other. What? And all the studies now, about aging and living longer. Yeah, diet. Yeah, that's the second predictor. Cancer, heart disease, blah, blah, blah. Start eating shit. Community. Yeah. Studies around the world. People living in co-housing. You know, um, old folks' homes where they got, uh, you know, university students living with them. Like, what experiences? Other than surfing or swimming with the dolphins or the fish and snorkeling in Bali, what experience touches you more? than when you sit down with people that you trust and break bread, right? This is ancient, man. This is back to like discovering fire and clubbing animals in a tar pit. That's how we got to serve. Then we started not just running around Uga Booga. Then we said, well, let's, let's form a village and so the, some of the people could stay home and like nurse and you know, keep the fire going, so we don't have to make another fire whack and rocks together, and the rest of us will go and club and we'll bring it back, and then we're like, this is really brutal. Like, how about if we grow some plants? So we can grow, <laughs> right? That's agriculture, right? Most destructive force of agriculture, at least industrial agriculture. More destructive than, than humans overall, more destructive than war, by far. More destructive than clear cutting, more destructive than automobile and flying. Agriculture. So you folks are this amazing group of people that live in this area, and every time that you you know, do things, I'm not going to say right or wrong, do things that are more in harmony with your surroundings, with more thought, with more love, with awareness of others. You are changing the world and making the world a better place. Questions? I'm interested in that thing with the skids and growing uh, food out of the skids. Yeah, so pallets, um, so what people do is you um, put some lambstick cloth in the pallet and then you... Um, pack soil in it and then you stand the pallet up. You have to make sure it's fairly well packed or it tends to slide down. Yeah. So that's that's one way to do kind of vertical growing, you know, especially if you have vertical soil. Let's say you let's say you're wrenching around here and yeah. you're just like we when we moved in we actually like virtually stealing soil from the property. You know, like oh here's a little soil in nature soy trees and we stole <laughs> like that was that dramatic and so you pack it with soil and you uh, make some plants. I was thinking of putting you know a little piece of wood to, to, Sure. To keep it that in. would be even better. Yeah yeah yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah yeah. yeah. Because I have some, seen some people do it and they don't pack the soil well enough and then it kind of slides down. We, yeah. we did a strawberries and barrels recently and we used some very loose material manure and then it, it packed down <laughs> and uh, things are falling apart. And then the, the strawberries kind of sunk a little bit and some of them came out of their holes. So that was a good learning for us. The next time we do that, it needs to be a denser soil that's not, it, it's going to decompose less once we've built that. Okay. Is that, how well does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm thinking, wow. Growing on pallets, what a great idea when you don't yeah. have a lot of space. Yeah, absolutely. So go go up, uh, you know, go higher with your tomatoes, use longer stakes, uh, grow grapes up a tree, grow tomatoes up the tree, use trees. We've grown, uh, one second, and we've had um, uh, same anything, it's really cheap, uh, free to get, because they can't throw the stuff like in the dump, the machine that makes the, you know, all that garbage into soil, you know, that machine in the dump. They, have to, they usually keep the nets to the side from the fish farms, you can get free nets. Oh. And so we, we hung netting off our, Sun deck, and we actually grew the squash up. Whoa. And our sun deck was like second story, and then up, and then over, and then there was squash laying on our deck. And then we had, uh, you know, Tofino people hang those uh, red uh, things, uh, the boat bumper things, to show yeah. where their driveway is. Well, we had squash <laughs> hanging from the cedar tree. I had to go up the ladder to get the red cooking. Uh, what you want to say, sweetie? I was just going to say, um, remember Vita Turek telling us when, when using pallets to use the ones that are stamped HD? Because there's no toxins in those ones. Yes. They're heat treated oh. rather than. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because sure. some of them are treated yeah. with chemicals. Yeah. Sure. And you can usually kind of just tell by looking at them. Mm -hmm. 
color. Do you plant the potatoes in the same spot every year? Because my dad went through the depression and said never plant the potatoes in the same spot. Excellent question, farms. thank you. So ro rotational farming, rotational grazing, everything should be rotated. So we're growing one acre, so we have very little, little room to rotate. Plus, part of its personality, going back to personality, birth order, Germanic, etc. Do everything is a hard day, you know. Like in, in Russia, they actually ran out of diesel. They were pushing the tanks, you know. Like the, the generals, because my dad was there, and like, oh, we got no diesel. Push the tanks. They were pushing the tanks. Like, we don't get German. We don't need diesel. We push them, right? Okay. And so, so I have this tendency to, to see how far I can take something. Relationships. This talk. See if I get in trouble. We have <laughs> United Church, right? And and so, so we do almost no rotation. Just partly that dynamics. We have so little area in this property that has any soil. We've made almost all the soil, so we're really limited about doing this. And so we do it a little bit. Like for instance, this year we're going to move the beets like one bed, and the carrots one bed. You know, root crops will rotate root crops with non-root crops. So the down bugs will be different than the up bugs, and reduce our carrot rust line a lot. Okay. Um, and then with potatoes, the main way we cope with that. Number one, when I plant in spring because it's really wet. And I dig most of the wire rolls at the top so I can pick those. So our biggest issue with potatoes, at least from a marketing perspective, not from eating and eating the sand, but it's just people don't want to buy holy potatoes. Right? Unless they're very Christian and they like holy potatoes. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so sorry, that, was, that was accidental. Um, and, and so then scab, scab generally is more of a disease that you're bringing in when you buy your seed potatoes or you're reusing your own potatoes or you're using too much scab. 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, or if you're using too much nitrogen. Okay, say those two things again. Uh, wireworms yeah. and scab. So too wireworms. Much, too much nitrogen? Yeah. Um, if sometimes when we put the manure on, too much manure on, then that, that, that causes the potatoes mm -hmm. to react because, you know, potatoes don't need a lot of nitrogen. And when you get too much, you end up with these tops. We've had like tops this tall, and then there's just little potatoes because. You're giving the plant the wrong message. You're giving it too much nitrogen. So, and as I said, um, they they will they will scab up a lot more. Remember you said, especially mm -hmm. the young potatoes. So some potatoes are more scab resistant. But again, this is you know we're thinking more in terms of marketing and selling. Like if we were just eating potatoes and they have worms and then we just cut them with worms and dig the sand out with our thumbnail, right? And you don't want to do that. But we have to think about marketing and people expecting the vegetables to look exactly the same or better. In the farmer's market at the grocery store and be cheaper. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. we, you know, we have our prices have gone up for 11 years. They have gone up in the stores and people stick them in the farmer's market. Hey, it's so expensive. I'm like, <laughs> actually, I just checked Superstore and Walmart that I don't shop at, but I went in there and almost all prices are now lower than the grocery store people. And part of it, in people's defense, is they still think it's 1960. You know, mm -hmm. when I was a kid, the minimum wage was 275. Right? And cars were, I remember when cars were $3,999. I saw the signs in Kingsway, and then they were, then I remember when they went to 6999 And then suddenly it wasn't, then it was the monthly loan price, and then finally it was the monthly lease price. And suddenly cars were $15,000. So, yeah. Um, so that's part of the, the issue with growing fruits for sale. You have to think a lot about who you're trying to sell it to, and you know, your price point, and what their expectations are. Um, how well does that answer your question about rotation? You planted those potatoes really deep, and what do you fertilize them with naturally? Like we uh, produce about this much compost every year. Wow. So anything we can get. It's like a dumpster. It's like, a, it's like a dumpster size. Yeah. It's huge. So the other day, dare I say this, how many people are going to go on Facebook and say, Dirk uses dead beavers. Anyway, Cowichan Regional District uh, recently had a beaver issue. They hired someone, and this guy came and bought rainbows for his mom. And I says, "Hey, what's that in those garbage bags? It's looking mighty suspicious." He goes, "Beavers? No." I says, "Can I have them?" <laughs> so beavers, horses, whales, seals. I mean, if I lived in Fino, I'd walk the beach every day. Is that a seal over there? <laughs> Back up the car. Beep beep beep. Yeah. I mean, you think about like someone brought us a horse live. It was live when they brought it. But um, imagine if we had a bike. Then what right? happens? Yeah, no, it's very humane. Dear. It's big, big hole, big bang. Right? Well, it versus a vet, and then uh, and then six hundred fifty dollars, and then uh, Midland Home comes with the big 
flat tech truck, beep, 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 drag it up by the neck, and then they take it down and it goes into hazardous waste. Why? Because it's got toxic chemicals. So, so which is more ethical? Bring it to, you know, someone like us who, you know, it's got a nose in a bucket, it's completely happy, it doesn't even hear anything, just suddenly it's, like, it's gone to, uh, what do you call that, um, what did the dog say? Rainbow Bridge. The Rainbow Bridge for horses. <laughs> That's what people say on Facebook. My dog went to the Rainbow Bridge, right? We like to spiritualize. <laughs> We're not into science. Don't give me that scientific crap, okay? So whatever I believe, it's my, in my humble opinion, I may show me. That's reality, okay? So, uh, so going back to the very beginning of the talk, I said the number one thing is to grow soil. So compost is the number one way to grow soil. And so think that you're not actually feeding the plants. Forget about it. Forget about plants, ignore them. You're feeding the soil. The soil feeds the plants. So your job is to, right, sauerkraut, kimchi, Vegan diet. Kom kombucha, sorry? Vegan diet. Yeah, is, so your job to, is to keep this biome so you don't go cuckoo. They're now making connections between cuckoo and biome. Criminal activity, <laughs> Alzheimer's, dementia, people completely losing it in old folks' homes. Biome. Yeah. Look at the food they're feeding those people. You know, I'm already whacked. Now think about if I jail for you. Think I'm bad now. This is me on not coffee, right? You should see me when I drink coffee. So, um, so you're feeding the biome, and that biome will take care of the plants. You want to see magical plants? Give the food to the one tablespoon of soil. Eight billion microbes of 200,000 different types. Is that magical? And then, in the carrot tops, you have these microndia, which are similar to the ones that in your cell with your glucose. Right? glycogen burning, they signal the carrot of what nutrients that they want. And the carrot then absorbs nutrients from the byproducts of the sex of the microbes beneath the carrot, which then the carrot uptakes, which then end up in the carrot top, which is then eaten by these creatures that live in the carrot top. And they are signaling for nutrients that are also compatible, symbiotic with the carrot. So everybody's happy. Now, as you see, so you can see how chemical farming is the opposite of that, right? We, we, we give them crack, crack cocaine, okay, right? So they have lots of energy, like people think Red Bull has got energy. There's no, er no energy in any green drink in the world. The energy comes from you digesting something and then turning it into something, right? But taking crack cocaine, that's not, right? That is not energy. And so when we put crack cocaine on the vegetables, yes, they grow and they run around and they take all the clothes off and the cops can shoot the vegetables five times and they keep running, but that's not really a healthy lifestyle, right? And I wouldn't eat those people. So when you feed the carrots with organic matter, right? Now you're talking about like a vegan that's eating organic food. Right? I would eat a vegan that's eating organic food. Right? I mean, no offense to eating, I guess that would be cannibalism to which you would be vegan. But I would just, you know, leave the point, right? Okay, question, please. I just wanted to ask you more about your composting method please. that you use. Yes. Like, I would like to hear a bit more. Sure. Okay. So, the reason I went to the dramatic of the beavers and the horses is because I really wanted to make the point that, to answer your question, everything goes. Okay. So leaves, mm -hmm. grass, like, and weeds are the very best if you can compost them hot enough so you don't get the seeds. But you don't get weed seeds in, uh, from weeds unless they have seeds on them. So you can always, you know, cut those the seed heads off and put those somewhere else, or make sure that you're they're at the bottom of the compost pile. We've even composted morning glory. We've composted the worst worst. We even grow weeds on purpose, like we're comfrey, okay. because they have roots down, you know, ten feet, mm -hmm. and so we let the comfrey grow until it's like taking over around the fruit trees, not the garden garden. And we cut that, and then it goes in the chickens eat it, the yeah. ducks eat it, super high in minerals. So you, you don't have to store and buy stuff made from comfrey. Mm -hmm. You can have a bruise, a kid fell at the farmer's market, had a big giant purple a goose egg in his head, and we were selling comfrey just for fun. And he said, here, you know, go like this, chew this, put this in your kid's head. In 20 minutes, the, the goose egg was gone, and the kid was screaming, like, you know, like there was a screaming kid, you know, like, oh, screaming kid. So, so anything goes. Leaves, leaves in the parks, I was in Tofino, uh, like, uh, you're visiting your friends in Nanaimo or something, and it's like Halloween, and they raked all the leaves. You know, wait till they finish raking. Don't go. Oh, I'll help. No, no, just wait. You want those leaves? Put them in your car. I've stolen leaves from all kinds of places. Yeah, you. you know? <laughs> just driving back from Vancouver once, and I drove along the slow road there, and it was like a garbage pickup uh, where they put the leaves in the clear bag. So I just you know, got on the ferry and everything else, and I was, I was, I was like overhyped. I had to go in there, jump on. You know, yeah. So everything. Red readers. Composting, 
Red Riggers are your friend. Get some Red Riggers from someone. Buy them if you really have to. And uh, they now you've got vermiculture. Now you've got you know little worms that have eaten stuff and put it up. So now you're growing with the poo of creatures that have eaten compost. I mean, does it get any better than compost eaten by creatures than that poo have processed the food and now it's bioavailable, completely bioavailable for plants. It doesn't get any better than that. And we do hot, hot com composting and cold composting. Yeah, there's some where we're trying to break things down like the horse one month. The horse was just vertebrate rolling out of the compost. Uh, we also do cold composting because we, it's winter time, we don't have time, we don't care, cover with the tarp, and we'll just leave that longer. And we're not so worried about pathogens and da 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 da. We're more concerned about the biome of the compost. And so one of the disadvantages with hot composting is you're also killing some of the good stuff. It's like cooking, kind of. Yeah, like, yeah. You're, you're, you're getting towards pasteurization, Louis Pasteur, right? You're, mm -hmm. you know, right? So it's not raw milk anymore, now it's pasteurized, pasteurized. Milk, right? So that's, that's why the kimchi, all of that, is that's a live food, right? Yeah. So you can take the healthiest vegan food in the world, and the moment you get past 212 degrees Fahrenheit, it is now dead. It's still got nutrients that are no longer alive, right? That's the miracle of fresh food, is you are a living creature, right? And you are made to feed off and burn living food. Maybe just one more question, or? Okay, well, I'll just check with the group. Uh, how are we doing for questions? How are we doing? So what doesn't work is that people start going, oh, I gotta go, and then you know, get that little trickle out, and the energy dies, and it well, just we just hit the minute, that's the one hour mark. Wow, okay, wow, we really compressed it. Okay, how are we doing? And how are we doing? Uh, how many, do you want to go five more minutes, ten more minutes? How, how's the group think? That's all good. Okay. I can, I can okay. do about, Yeah, because the last, I just start crying and people just start doing that, putting in their coats thing. Then I'll quickly close. If I start seeing that, that's totally fine. Then then I will do one more in the coast. Before they leave, Please. tell them about the um, oh. eggs and Also, we brought uh, duck eggs. Uh, they're $8 in the store, only $6 here. They are um, unwashed, so they will last weeks, if not months. Uh, those great eggs in the store are always weeks old anyway, if not months. And so these are nice and fresh. Way higher in micronutrients. Um, butternut squash, one of the reasons we brought them also to show people, uh, we have a couple of butternut squash at home that are from the previous year, which means they are a year and a half old now. Wow. So in terms of what you can grow here in Tofino, squash is one of the most amazing ones, the, the three sisters, corn bean squash, right? The Incas, the Mayans, all these other, all the, the new world. Um, and they keep, right? So amazing food, only $1.50 a pound, that's less than the store, that's $2 a store for inorganic, we're organic, but only $1.50 a pound, so, um, please. Do you recommend any associations of plants together to grow? Yes, um, so simple search, companion plants, mm -hmm. so we do some of that, um, you know, I've also learned some things work much better, thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, for instance, we'll put kale and chard. She's my ride, I have to. Okay, thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for telling me. <laughs> she doesn't like me. She hates the dog. Um, underneath fruit trees, is the fruit trees shaded? So there are quite a few plants that are much happier together, like the, the basil, for instance, the tomatoes, and the single apple. So there's quite a few. So very simple, companion planting. And there's, you can even actually buy books that focus on that. So we tend more to work in terms of what is most efficient for us and what people will buy. So we have less time and energy to devote to doing things the way we'd like to do them, and we have to think more in terms, unfortunately, in terms of economics and what sense. Please. Do you think that having a permaculture food forest system can still be something marketed for sale, or is that a slightly less efficient way of, of, of making things for sale as well? So, Jeff Lawton's videos, where he goes on and on, which I took my phone coach goes through them. Hey, look at that avocados hanging in there. Oh, look yeah, at yeah. that. Hey, oh, there's a food for so there's a bunch here. But he's always in tropical country. So when we moved into a place right away, I'm going to be, I'm going to be Jeff Lawton in Arrington, British Columbia. I'm going to yo-yo Joe Flatton, right? So we planted fruit trees close to the forest, and immediately the the freaking wild trees said, "Wow, <laughs> smell it over there. It smells like cobbles. Wow, well, it looks like they watered over there." Yeah, so we had a hell of a time. Those trees didn't grow for three years. Mm -hmm. So so what I've noticed now when people use the food forest term, like in Nanaimo where they did a food forest, is they did a community garden with fruit trees and vegetables. So it's a park with a forest of food. 
but it's certainly a far cry from what Jeff Lawton and the other permaculturists that go to South, South America and Southern California. And go in a desert and just plant the thing. Plant, yeah. you know, avocados and cacti are living in harmony and everything. And everywhere you go, you can just pick food off the tree. So this is the West Coast. It's a little, yeah, it's, yeah. So uh, it's, it's a nice idea. And, uh, and I think that some permaculturists do us all a disservice when we push this idea. Um, more than is going to serve us. So I think we always need to think of what will work, not what sounds great, what looks great on YouTube that makes us say, I want to do that, more in terms of what what will work, especially if you're newer or this place going. No, so a follow up on, on that, uh, I have quite a bit of shade in this. Right. Are there some crops I can grow in the shade successfully? Yeah, so the simple answer, besides shade crops, right, because of time, energy, is um, crops that are cool weather crops. So all the brassicas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kale, chard, all of those don't like a lot of sun. So they're not going to grow as readily if they don't get lots of sun when, it be, when they want it. But at least they will do a lot better when you've got lots of sun and it's hot. So you'll, you'll lose a little bit of growth because you have a lack of sun when you really want it, let's say, in March, April, May. But then you will have this nice lush lettuce that's not bolting in May, June, July, August because you've got shade. Does that make sense? Yes. So again, you're learning, and then again with the squash, you can get the squash to grow up the trees on strings or a piece of seine netting or something. Well, now we are capitalizing on the sunshine again. The other thing is you can hire someone, or you can do it yourself. I do it. I just climb the tree freehand, and I cut every third branch. So I go. It's called spiral pruning. Yep. Yes. Never top a tree, yes. unless there's some special reason, because then you've got that tofino candelabra giant bush <laughs> and lots of shade. Uh, there was somebody else here. Was it? How are we doing? Yes, please. Cold composting. Okay. How do you do it? What's the difference? Like um, the difference is, the short version is, when you do everything right, in terms of your carbon-nitrogen mix, and target, then the microbes um, multiply, and the chemical reaction from them basically copulating, and all of the byproducts from that, just like sauerkraut or wine, generates heat. That's why you'll see places where they make soil that they actually have these big fires that erupt in their piles. And so that's your nitrogen carbon ratio. And one of the most important things with compost <clears throat> is too wet and the microbes drown. Too dry and they die at first. So in wintertime, you need to be targeting and not letting it get so wet. And in summertime, you actually need to water it from your rain barrels or your catching water from the gutter with your, your wheelbarrow or compost tea, or urine, or whatever it is you have, and you need to keep it just the right moisture. So you squeeze it, and it glistens, and you let go, and then it's not glistening. That's your perfect moisture content. You just virtually feel it and smell it. It'll just smell right. Compost should not smell. Stink, at least. So it's, so it's, it's, just, so it's just composting. I'm sorry? So it's, like, what's the difference between cold composting and hot composting? Okay, hot so in simple terms, if you do composting correctly, it means that you have your carbon-nitrogen ratio correct and your moisture level correct, and that will always generate heat to the point where it will melt plastic. If you do things wrong, and it's either too wet or too dry or too high in carbon or too high in nitrogen and gooey and yucky and gross, then it will not generate heat, and then it will by default be cold composting. So if I put a whole bunch of horse manure, which has got too many cedar chips in it, and it's wet, it can sit there for years before it'll compost because it's cold composting. If we do it just perfectly uh, and have nitrogen, maybe add a little bit of grass from a landscaper, and we tarp it, that'll be like soil in six weeks. Okay. So the biggest benefit, the two biggest benefits of hot, compo com hot composting, one would be speed, that is how quickly you can produce want the wanted desired product and the other would be to kill pathogens and weed seeds <laughs> how are we doing i have to go okay close thank you okay. so much so thank you folks you are changing the world by doing what you're doing thank you thank you